Good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you've joined in today. Let me invite you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 3, the Old Testament book of Ruth chapter 3. A good man is hard to find. That's the backstory of Ruth chapter 3. It's all about the strangest marriage proposal in the whole Bible. If you're looking for ways to ask someone to marry you, the strategy that Ruth employed will likely be at the very bottom of your list. Here's what we have. A woman asks a man to marry her, and he agrees. Now, that's a little bit unusual, but there's more to consider. A foreigner asks a Jew to marry her. That's extremely unlikely. And if we peer a little closer, we realize that an employee asks her boss to marry her. Stranger yet. And finally, it's a younger woman who approaches an older man at midnight on the threshing floor to ask him to marry her. All of this is highly irregular to say the least. This story teaches us that God has his ways, and sometimes those ways seem very strange indeed. Now we're going to come back to that in a second. Of course you know how it happened. Ruth was so lonely that she logged into eHarmony.com and she filled out her profile to find someone who was compatible with her. No, that's not how it happened. In fact, if eHarmony had existed back then, there's no way they would have ever been matched. Boaz was much older, he was wealthy, she was a beggar, he was an Israelite with pedigree, she was an immigrant with no standing whatsoever. Actually, as I thought about it, eHarmony is okay but there's a better way to find your mate. I call it G-Harmony. If you want a mate, just ask God. And the good thing about asking God for help is that it's free. Ruth and Boaz have a midnight rendezvous at the threshing floor, and it's the moment that we've been waiting for. As we dive into this great story, I want to mention four main characters in this chapter and how they teach us lessons from the night at the threshing floor. Here's the first character, Naomi's hope. She emerged from bitterness when she put Ruth's needs first. When Naomi returned uh, to Bethlehem, she was a bitter woman. She says, don't even call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Lord has made my life very bitter. But beginning in chapter 3, verse 1, we begin to see a change in Naomi's attitude. In verse 1 of, of Ruth chapter 3, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. Now, in the second chapter of Ruth, Naomi is almost reclusive. Instead of going out and gathering leftover grain with Ruth, she just sticks at home. 
We don't know if health or old age prevented her from going, but she might have just been pouting. It's easy to become bitter when all you think about is little old me. But a change occurred in Naomi's attitude when she started thinking about finding Ruth a husband. And for the first time, she has a plan. She has hope. Bitterness and hope are mutually exclusive. They can exist both at the same time in your heart. Maybe you should try that. Try taking your eyes off of your own problems and start trying to help other people in need. That's a great cure for bitterness. Now, what lesson could we learn here? Well, we should make creative plans to follow God's will. You know, when I come to this section of Ruth, I feel like singing that song from Fiddler on the Roof, Matchmaker, Matchmaker, Make Me a Match, Find Me a Find, Catch Me a Catch. Naomi hatched a plan to have Ruth confront Boaz all alone on the threshing floor. She said, girl, take a bath, use some perfume, put on your best dress, you go pop the question. (coughs) Don't let him get away. Her plan was bold and risky, but it worked. So was Naomi showing a lack of faith by formulating a plan to make it happen? Well, that's a question that still needs answering today. How much help does God need in accomplishing his will? There's two extremes when it comes to understanding God's involvement in our lives. On one side, you have what is called deism. That's the belief in a watchmaker God. This view of God asserts that he created the world like a watchmaker who then made the watch and then wound it up and he lets it just run by itself. In deism, God isn't involved in our lives. So if we want something to happen, we've got to make it happen. Now, of course, according to the word of God, that's wrong. Now, the other extreme is fatalism. That's the belief that everything that happens is already predetermined, and we have no control over what happens. And if something is destined to happen, it will happen regardless of what we do. There was an old Quaker who held this view that everything that happened was predetermined. And one day as he was walking down his cellar steps, he tripped and he tumbled all the way down to the bottom. And he stood up and said, well, I'm glad that's over. (laughs) As is often the case, the truth lies somewhere between those two extremes. God is interested in every area of our lives. He has the hairs of our head numbered, and neither are we victims of blind fate. We aren't just pawns on God's chessboard that he moves at will. We are responsible human beings, and we have a part in making God's will come about. And like Naomi, we should be making bold plans within God's will. For instance, it's God's will for everyone to put their faith in Jesus. But that's not going to happen unless we make some plans and we carry out some creative actions to make that happen. That's why we share our faith. Naomi came up with a bold plan to introduce Ruth to her Redeemer. Now notice how specific Naomi is. She knew that Boaz would sleep with his head facing inward and his feet facing outward. Ruth had to find a way to arrive at the threshing floor undetected, figure out where he was sleeping, and wait until he had finished eating and drinking. And finally, she was to uncover his feet, because that would guarantee he would eventually wake up. Now perhaps the most surprising part is Ruth's response in verse 5. She says, I will do everything that you say. She knew the risk involved. There were were so many reasons 
to say no, but she said yes. And that's how God's plan unfolds for his children. On one hand, it appears as if Ruth is taking a big risk on her own. But behind Naomi's plan stood God who orchestrated every detail, including Boaz's cold feet that woke him up at midnight. Faith means taking a risk for God and leaving the results in his hands. When the sun went down and Ruth left for the threshing floor, Naomi was pacing furiously, not knowing what was going to happen next. That's how faith works. We take a step forward, following the little bit of light that we do have, trusting God to bring us out in the right place. Sometimes things don't work out as planned, but that's okay too. Our part is to take the first step, and God can take care of the rest. Now the second character that we see here is Ruth. Ruth's faith, she risked failure to ask Boaz to be her husband and redeemer. If Naomi was characterized by hope, Ruth demonstrated faith. I mean, it took a lot of faith to follow Naomi's bold plan. We read in verse 5 of Ruth chapter 3, And she said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, And his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. And the word there is goel that we talked about last week. Good for you, Ruth. The first thing I notice here is her obedience. She told Naomi, I will do exactly what you say. That's what faith is. It's believing God enough to do what he tells us to do in his word. She didn't just believe that the possibility that Boaz could be her goel. She believed enough to do something about it. You know, you can say that you believe the word of God until you're blue in the face, but the only part of the Bible you really believe is the part that you actually act on. The threshing floor was usually a rock floor enclosed by a circular arrangement of stones. It would have been located on the top of a hill in order to catch the breeze. The grain stalks would be piled there, and men and animals would tread on the stalks to separate the kernel from the stalk. Then they would use a wooden winnowing fork to toss the kernels up into the air. The breeze would blow away the lighter husk or the shaft, and the heavier grain would fall to the earth. This threshed grain represented the wealth of a farmer. So during this time, the owner would sleep at the threshing floor to guard his valuable treasure of grain. Now can't you just picture Ruth as she slips toward the threshing floor? She watches where Boaz lies down and waits. And then she is sure, when she is sure that he's asleep, she creeps up, she takes his cloak, which is covering his legs, and folds up the cloak until his feet are exposed. And then she lies down at his feet and waits. And when Boaz wakes up, she proposes marriage to Boaz. Now, If it didn't sound like a marriage proposal to you, that's probably because you don't have a Jewish background. That phrase, take your maidservant under your wing, was a reference to a wedding ceremony. It was a straightforward marriage proposal. That phrase, take me under your wing, can also be translated as spread your covering over me. 
It was Ruth's way of saying, marry me and bring me under your protection. Even to this day at Jewish weddings, the groom will cover his bride with a silk or linen cloth. More modern Jewish weddings have put the cloth over the couple as a canopy, but the symbolism of the same being covered. Now, we need this lesson from this part of the story. We should take bold steps when it comes to trusting God. When God tells you to do something in his word, do you say, I'll do it? You know, sometimes we overanalyze God's Word, and we suffer from the paralysis of analysis. We have a failure to launch. There's an old Chinese fable about overanalyzing a situation. It translates into English this way. Once upon a time, a mother duck was teaching her ducklings to walk, and one of her ducklings couldn't figure it out. She said, but mama, do I start with my left foot? or my right foot, and the mother duck said, hush, and just walk. When it comes to trusting and obeying God, the Nike slogan comes to mind, just do it. Some Christians never experience God's best because they spend all of their lives sitting around waiting for God to give them more information before they launch out. It is possible to be so afraid of making mistakes that we do nothing. But when you read clear instructions from God in his word, the Bible, he's already given you permission to launch out. Trusting God is a little bit like surfing. If you want to surf, you need to buy the right equipment. You need to get trained, and you need to go to the beach. But you can't make the wave. Only God can do that. But you've got to swim out and ride the wave. You don't have to look around and wonder what God's will is. Just look to see where God is working and join him. Too many Christians are obsessed with how can I build a wave. You don't have to wring your hands and try to find something to do for God. Look around you. God is up to a lot of great things. Just join him. The surf is up. The third character we see here is Boaz himself. And we want to talk about Boaz's love because he rewarded Ruth's faith with his offer of protection and provision. You know, we've seen Naomi's hope and we've seen Ruth's faith And here we see Boaz's love. The Bible says that these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. In verse 10 of our text, Then he, speaking of Boaz, said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. For you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night. And in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. 
Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Now, you would expect me to tell you that uncovering the feet was some ancient cu- uh, custom that prospective wives practiced. I hate to disappoint you, but I think that the reason that Naomi told Ruth to uncover his feet is, is that Boaz would wake up because his feet got cold. After all, Boaz wouldn't be the first man to get cold feet. But in this case, Cold feet led to a wedding. Now picture this. Uh, uh, Boaz, he lays down to sleep, and suddenly he stirs, realizing that his feet are uncovered. And peering into the darkness, he makes out the form of a woman lying at his feet. Now that was startling, and it was troubling. I mean, was she a prostitute? After all, it was known that a man could buy sexual favors at the threshing floor. So Boaz asks, well, who are you? And she identifies herself and says, take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Now, how would you like to wake up to cold feet and get a marriage proposal? I mean, uh, I wonder if Boaz was even fully awake at that point. You know, if Boaz had been a lesser man, he might have tried to take advantage of her. He could have said, well, let's go ahead and sleep together and I'll think about it in the morning. But he didn't do that. The first thing that Boaz did, he pronounced a blessing on Ruth and then he complimented her for her kindness in choosing him instead of one of the younger, more eligible bachelors. And then he commended her for her character and her good reputation. Now that brings us to another important lesson here. God always rewards our acts of faith. God rewarded Ruth's faith with Boaz's love and acceptance. The key verse about faith in the Bible is Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 where it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seeks him. Do you remember Naomi's complaint back in chapter 1? She said, I left full, but I returned empty. When she left Bethlehem with her family, she had a husband, sons, and enough resources to travel and live abroad. But she returned empty. Ruth's testimony is precisely the opposite. She came to Boaz empty and returned full. She had a cloak full of grain and a heart full of hope. Faith is coming to the edge of everything you can see and feel and then taking one more step. It's believing that God will either be there to catch you or if not, he'll teach you how to fly. Is there an area of your life where you need to obey God by faith? You know, many years ago at another church that I was on staff, We had a young married couple who came to know Christ after starting to attend the church, and they were all excited about their faith. They had no church background, and one Sunday they heard our pastor preaching, and he mentioned that every Christian ought to tithe. And the young couple approached me after the service and said, Pastor Tracy, we heard what the pastor said, and we decided to tithe. Now, can you tell us what that is? And I had to explain to them that it meant giving a tenth of their income to the Lord's work. And they said, great. They didn't even know what it meant. And they were willing to trust God and to obey him. That's the kind of faith God rewards. Now, there's a fourth character we see here. And it's the character of Jesus. 
We don't really see him mentioned directly in this passage, but we do see a symbol of him. We see the grace of Jesus. Jesus accepts us into his family, even though we are strangers. The story of Ruth is a love story about how a foreign widow from the pagan land of Moab receives kindness and grace from Boaz. She had no identity, no future. In Boaz, she finds a new family and a new future. It's also a powerful allegory of how we are to all, how we all start out as foreigners and strangers in relationship to God. We're all born into the wrong family. But like Boaz, Jesus lovingly accepts us into the family of God. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 19 of that chapter says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. When Boaz woke up that night, he said, Who is it? And Ruth said, It is Ruth, your servant. Before this time, Ruth is often referred to as Ruth the Moabitess. Nobody wanted her to forget she was unclean and unacceptable as a pagan Moabite. But here, (coughs) Ruth makes no mention of her past. Instead, she speaks of her future. She said, I am at your service. When you come to Jesus, you can forget your past too, and you make yourself available to Jesus. I'm at your service, Lord. Now, the final lesson we want to draw from all of this is all of our hopes (coughs) are fulfilled at the feet of Jesus. You know, at the feet of Boaz, Ruth's life was changed. There she found a new family and a new future. That's what we find at the feet of Jesus. According to the law of the Leverite marriage, Ruth had the the right to confront Boaz publicly and demand that he marry her according to the law. But instead, she approached him privately. You know, a lot of our faith is practiced in public. We worship together, We serve together. But the true essence of following Jesus boils down to having a personal relationship with him. Who you are spiritually isn't determined by what you do publicly on Sundays. It's who you are day in and day out in your personal walk with Jesus. You know, I have a great time here on Sundays worshiping Jesus with the folks and sharing his word. But I've got to confess that some of the sweetest times I have with the Lord are when he and I are together one-on-one, just me and my Savior. Boaz and Ruth, it was a match made in heaven. Throughout history, there have been many famous couples, Adam and Eve, uh, uh, Boaz and Ruth, Romeo and Juliet, (laughs) Ken and Barbie, Brad and Angelina. But the most loving couple in history is Christ and his church. The Bible teaches that God loves us the way a perfect husband loves a bride, even though she's less than perfect. For instance, this love is expressed in Isaiah chapter 62, Like an unfaithful wife, Israel had strayed from God. But rather than rejecting Israel, God promised a rebellious nation. He said, no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. But you will be called Hephzibah, which means my delight, and your land Beulah, which means my bride. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. 
Even though Israel had sinned and been rebellious, God offered to take her as his bride. You probably have heard the song Beulah Land and thought that Beulah meant heaven. It's a nice song, but this is the only time the name Beulah appears in the Bible. And it's God's way of telling you he wants to love you the way that a husband loves his bride. Jack Edwards and his wife Gwen had been out to enjoy the nice weather in Beacon Park in Litchfield, England. They had been married for 61 years and spent all their time together. And while they were waiting at the bus stop to return home, a car driven by a drunk driver crashed through a barrier and was barreling right at them. In that split second, 83-year-old Jack pushed his wife safely out of the way of the speeding car. She escaped with only minor injuries, but Jack took the brunt of the force and he was killed instantly. And witnesses reported that Jack could have saved himself, but in choosing to save his wife, he sacrificed his own life. You know, we're all touched by stories like that, But that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus went to the cross to die for his bride, the church. He loves you that much. Will you trust him as your redeemer? Will you accept him as your heavenly husband? It's a match made in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. We thank you, Father, for your word, and we thank you for the instructions that it gives. And Lord, we pray today that we would recognize that we are in a relationship with Jesus. It's a husband-wife relationship. Father, we pray that we would have that kind of love for our husband, for Jesus. Lord, as we have seen this story, how that uh, Ruth and Boaz, how they uh, came together, Lord, we pray that you would help us to see that relationship in our own lives. Father, I pray that if there's someone who does not know Jesus as Savior, I pray that today they will feel the drawing of the Spirit and that they will make Jesus their Savior. Thank you, Father. We just ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Next Sunday, we're going to be continuing our sermon series out of the book of Ruth, and we hope that you can join us. Also, this coming Wednesday, we continue our live online Bible study out of 1 Corinthians. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. If you miss any of the Bible studies or any of the sermons, you can check them out on Facebook or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.